I don't know of any subject that needs to be spoken of from God's word better than this subject on joy at this time in our world's history. Let me ask you a couple of questions to begin with. Is your life an exciting, cheerful journey? Is it? Or has it become more drudgery than delight? Is it cheery or is it dismal? Have, you, have your expectations of pleasure and peace and contentment been dashed by disappointments and difficulties? Many people are right there in that particular situation. They are weighed down by the cares of the world, not just the pandemic, not just politics, but family and every other source weighs them down. Maybe that person, and perhaps it's you, have seasons of happiness when everything's going well, but soon the disappointment comes and you are down lower than a hound dog's belly. Most of us have to admit we don't ha know many people that are filled with joy most of the time. Even Christians are not filled with joy most of the time because they are not listening to what God says. Focus on me. Focus on me. Our focus begins to be on things that are sent our way that aren't very comfortable, aren't very nice, and some of them are very dangerous to us, and that's where our focus is. But if we focus on these things, we will not have the joy of the Lord as our strength. We have to refocus our minds and hearts on the word of God and the things that are taught to us in that word. It is very important that we understand that. Number one, which isn't on the screen, but it will be someday. Throughout the Old Testament, the Lord commanded the Israelites to rejoice. He commanded them to rejoice. He even instituted feasts, some of which lasted seven days for celebrating before him. Now think about that. Seven days of celebration in a very difficult, difficult environment. And that's one of the biggest problems there can be. They focused on the big problems that they were going through, the trials they were going through. But God said, I want you to refocus, and so I'm going to inaugurate these feasts. These feasts will be something that are filled with rejoicing spirits. If, indeed, the joy of the Lord is our strength, then the reality of it is this. Without joy, we cannot win people to Jesus Christ. No one that has no joy and doesn't exhibit joy is ever going to be able to witness Jesus is all you need. The reality is this, my friends. What would it be like if uh, during the songs we sang at the beginning, which were full of joy, I sang them with a dismal look on my face. On purpose, I smiled a lot. Now, that isn't necessarily what was going on inside, but the Lord says, I want you to rejoice, and so I rejoiced in those songs. And when I sang those songs, if you want to run it back and look at them sometime, if you've got this on Facebook, you can look at it again. And you would see a smile because that is what the song is trying to display and that's what God wants me to take on. So these feasts were meant to cause the people to focus on the joy of the Lord rather than the trials they were going through. These were times for praising according to the word of God, and dancing, dancing unto the Lord, and singing to the Lord with thanksgiving for his provision and his deliverance. It's easy to forget 
how many times God brought us through different circumstances. Easy to forget that. In the wilderness, think of what God did for those beautiful years that they were in the wilderness. He fed them manna from heaven. He got them water from a rock. Their shoes didn't wear out. Everything was provided for them during that time. And when they got into the, uh, just before the promised land, they complained. We were better off in Egypt. What happened? They focused on what they had, not what God had done. Don't ever focus on the good old days. Someone says, I wish I lived in the good old days. Yeah, that's when the arrows started flying toward you and you didn't know if they were going to hit you and kill you. Or oh, that was uh, the good old days of the Korean War, World War I, World War II. All these are good old days. This is the good old day. Right now is the good old day. If, in the midst of a pandemic, it's a good old day if you're centering your attention on Jesus Christ. He has never left you, and he has never forsaken you. you uh, if you haven't had the disease by now, it's because of God's goodness to you. Focus on God's goodness, not on what could happen in the future. For what happens in the future doesn't often happen in the future. That means what I think is going to happen in the future never takes place. Never takes place. So they were told, in the midst of the trials, tribulations, and problems you're going through, Israel, celebrate these feasts and start praising God and start making merriment to God and his provisions for you. We find the same attitude in the New Testament. In Philippians 4, verse 4, Paul issues these instructions to the believers. Now, they're going through trials. They're going through tribulation. They're going through problems. And he says this to them, Rejoice in the Lord always. Again, I will say rejoice. Now, what is Paul trying to get across to them? You're going through the ty tyranny of Rome. Rome is not for you. They want to kill you. You're going through a trial. You're going through a tribulation. But rejoice in the Lord. Rejoice in the Lord. Center your attention on Jesus rather than on the problem. Jesus has promised to go through the valley of the shadow of death with you. And thus, like the psalmist, you can fear no evil because Jesus is there. Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, you're in the fiery furnace, but Jesus is there. Who cares about how hot it is? Who cares about what man can do to you? Jesus is there. Therefore, there's fellowship. There's wonderful joy. And I can imagine they had great joy inside the furnace. And when they came out of the furnace, they had great joy. They had been communing with Jesus. I can tell you of illustration after illustration after illustration of those that went into tribulation, trials, and problems. But when they focus on Jesus, there was joy unspeakable and full of glory. When they focused on the problem, they were downcast. And they thought, I don't think I can make it. Number two on the screen. Obviously, God's will is for us to be joyful or joyous people. God's will is for you to rejoice in the Lord always. Can you say you do? Don't wait until you feel like it. Don't wait until you feel like it. If you go by feelings, you're probably never going to do it. You'll be a grumpy old person. Have you ever heard of a grumpy old man or a grumpy old woman? There are also grumpy young men and grumpy young women. They're focusing on everything but what's going to be producing joy in them and happiness in them. I can truly say 
if I focus on the Lord, I'm a better husband. If she focuses on the Lord, she's a better wife. If we focus on the Lord, we're a better church congregation. But if we focus on our differences or our problems, then we're going to have division and splits and misery. The word of God makes it very clear then. We are to center our attention on Jesus rather than the problem that comes. Deal with the problem, but center your attention on Jesus and rejoice in Jesus in the midst of that situation. Now, I'll emphasize this more later, but it didn't say to rejoice in the problem. It said, turn your attention and rejoice in Jesus. Think about what he has done for you. Think about what he has promised to do for you. In order to understand lifestyles, God desires this lifestyle, God desires us to have, we need to know the difference between joy and happiness. Note number three on the screen. Both can be defined as gladness, delight, and pleasure in something. Gladness, delight, and pleasure in something. But happiness has an external cause. Somebody gives me a gift, a gift I'm happy until I open the gift. Find out it's a pair of stockings. If you ever, you know, as a child, <laughs> as a child when Christmas came and you opened some of your gifts and some of them were closed, you didn't appreciate that. I mean, that was probably a wonderful thing for the parent to give, but it, you didn't appreciate it. You wanted a toy. I was looking for the toy train. I was looking for the Mickey Mouse. Someone else in this body that's a deacon also looks to, for the Mickey Mouses. And you get joy in that what you're looking for. If it isn't what you're looking for, then you have to tolerate it. Well, I may have to tolerate it as a little child, but when I become an adult, I should be thankful for everything. In everything, give thanks. But I can also be thankful for what God has done for me and is currently doing for me. I am so blessed by God, and so are you. In this country, we're more blessed than we can even imagine. Most countries, they do not have what we have in America. Even with all that is negative about America, the positives outweigh the negatives, and I'm so glad to be an American. But I'm better, and I'm more glad, I should say, to be a servant of Jesus Christ and a citizen of heaven. When cir circumstances then are not favorable and delightful, we naturally aren't too happy. But when these events begin to turn around and they bring joy to us, we are rejoicing for that moment, and it's really happiness for that moment. Number four, joy, then on the other hand, has an internal cause. Happiness has an outward cause, but joy has an internal cause and is not dependent upon outside conditions. Jesus said, I'm going to give you joy. He didn't say, I'm going to give you happiness. You may sing it, happiness is the Lord, and uh, that is a result of the joy God has given to you, but the joy is what God says, I give to you. My joy, I give to you. It is something that is inside, and it is something that becomes part of you. Now, if you take your eyes off Jesus, you cannot experience that joy. You experience a lack of it because you have taken your eyes off the joy giver. But when you keep your eyes on the joy giver, which is Jesus Christ, it is fullness of joy. It is joy added upon joy added upon joy. As believers, we can keep our contentment in good times 
and in bad times. We can keep that joy when the trials of life come. Even though we don't like the trials, there's an inner joy that is overwhelming us. I went through some terrible situations with my folks dying and my brother dying, and that certainly became an awful thing that took away happiness, but I can tell you it didn't take away joy. It all happened, it seems this happens often, at the Christmas season, and I can tell you it never dulled my joy in what Jesus did for me on that day, being born of the Virgin Mary for a purpose to save me from my sin. It didn't steal that joy. It stole happiness in the loss of a loved one, but it could not steal the joy. It's based upon something Jesus put within each and every one of us. Since the source of our relationship then with Christ is what it is, the joy that the Bible describes is available only to Christians. You cannot have this joy that God says is an internal joy that won't pass away unless you have received Jesus Christ as your Savior. The world can have happiness for a moment, for a season, but it cannot have joy because Jesus is the source of our joy. And I must know him as Lord and Savior. So if you're celebrating Christmas without Jesus, you're going to have a lot of problems. You'll, you'll start talking about how this is a horrible season. I'm lonely. I've lost a loved one because your source was that loved one for Christmas. I understand that, but that's not the source of Christmas. Jesus is. Or you may say, I, I just hate going and buying for somebody and trying to give them a gift that will be adequate to what they give me. And, you know, it's all a selfish thing. It's all a selfish thing. Or I gave them something. They didn't give me anything. And I, I'm never going to give them something again. You have your viewpoint on something other than the real meaning of Christmas. Christmas is Jesus, totally Jesus. As the little pins that some of us wear at times say, Jesus is the reason for the season, and he is. No wonder the world wants to take away Christmas and call it something else. It has no meaning to them without Jesus and it will have no meaning to anyone without Jesus. You want Christmas to be special this year, then receive the Christ child as your Lord and Savior. You can't have joy like I've got joy. I've got the joy, 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 joy living in my heart. It's in my soul. And Jesus put it there. It's not a conditional thing. Only is it conditional as far as my experience if I take my eyes off Jesus. But it's there. It's planted within me. And happiness is never planted within us. Only joy. So the reality is that joy is available only to Christians. Number five, although every believer has access to joy, only those who are actively, notice this, living in obedience to the principles of God's word will consistently experience that joy. If you're not living by God's word, of course you're not going to experience the joy of the Lord as your strength. You know, I even will look. This is what I do. I don't know about you. I'll look into the mirror before I shave, and I will say to the person in the mirror, only God could love you that. <laughs> only God could love that. And, you know, I make fun of myself. My mother always felt, thought that that was a, a maladjusted child. <laughs> I'm always making fun of my. You know, I've never had a problem with myself because I don't take myself so seriously 
that if somebody offends me, I'm going to have a bad week. I know that Jesus put that inner joy in me when I was little. And I can look at myself and say, who's that in the mirror? There's an old timer in that mirror. And I can look and I can make fun of that old timer and recognize, but you don't know what I'm like inside. I'm young. I'm full of Jesus. It is because of my faith in Jesus Christ that I can say that. A cheerful heart not only lifts our spirits, it also influences others. If you are a person that is always down in the dumps, you're not going to help anybody. They don't want to go to your dump, and I don't want to go to their dump. So they're without friends. But if you have a joy that comes out of you because of your relationship and fellowship with Jesus Christ, every day takes on a new adventure with Jesus. Even trials, physical trials, take on a new adventure with Jesus. What is Jesus going to do through this illness I've got? What is Jesus going to do through this problem that has come into my life? And Jesus is faithful enough to do something. I just hold on and trust in Jesus. Simply trusting every day, trusting through a stormy way, even when my faith is small, trusting Jesus, that is all. God calls us to center our attention on Jesus and trust him, and the joy of the Lord will be our strength. And you'll be so joyful that you won't, you won't know what you like. You're so strange. You're, you're a joyful person, and you used to be a morose person. I like what the president says about we win, and we're going to keep winning. Well, I take it this way with spiritual understanding. We have the joy of the Lord, and we're going to keep on having the joy of the Lord because we're going to focus on Jesus, and it will never be defeated if we focus on Jesus Christ. He is our joy. He is our sufficiency. He is all we need. I don't need other things. I used to think I did. When I was young, I had this attitude. I had to, I, I thought I needed this, I needed that, I needed that. One of the objects I keep in the other room is an organ, and I thought I needed it. And I got that in my first ministry, and I haven't touched it since. I don't even know if it'll play, but you know what it reminds me of? I don't need what I needed before. Jesus is all I need. And we sing, he is all I need, he is all I need, Jesus is all I need, and then we appear not to believe it. He is all you need. He will be whatever you need. It's a real sad thing when people haven't found that Jesus is sufficient. He's sufficient for all their needs, and they can be confident in that. In the midst of a heartbreak, our deep abiding pleasure in the Lord can strengthen both ourselves and others because Jesus is what they need too. Number six. Paul told the Ephesian, or the Philippians, excuse me, when to rejoice. And he said, always. Now, that's a little far-fetched. You can't expect me to have the joy of the Lord all the time. My family wouldn't know me if I did that. Look, he was speaking the word of God. I am repeating the word of God to us all. Rejoice in the Lord always. Put down the blues. Put down the trials. And stand upon the word of God and say, I will rejoice in my Lord through this problem. In spite of this problem, I will rejoice in Jesus Christ. I will. It's a matter of the will. 
Jesus said in the garden, not my will, but thine be done, referring to his father. And that's what we must say, not my will be done, but God, may I do what you tell me to do. Rejoice in you, even though I don't understand what you're doing. And most of the time, we will not understand what he's doing because his ways are higher than our ways and his thoughts are greater than our thoughts. Everybody has times of hardship and we all have times of suffering. That's just part of living in a fallen, fallen, fallen world. This world is not my home. I'm just a passing through as the song goes. My treasures are laid up somewhere beyond the blue. It's called heaven. It's called heaven. That's where my treasure is. It's not on this earth. I could lose everything on this earth of any value, and I'd still have the greatest treasures still in heaven. You cannot lose those treasures. Moth and rust doesn't corrupt, it says. No thieves break through and steal. It's a sure thing I have that bankroll in heaven. It's what I've done for Jesus and what you've done for Jesus is that is that bankroll. But believers don't have to be despondent when life is hard. In fact, James, the first chapter, the second verse tells us, consider it all joy. Well, I'll go along with that, Jesus. But, oh, he goes on. Consider it all joy, my brethren. He's talking to believers when you encounter various trials. What is God going to do through this trial? How will he glorify his name in me and in this trial to others? How can you do this, Jesus? I'm going to consider it all joy because I know you have not allowed this in my life except for a greater blessing to come. Some people become indignant when they hear this verse because they think God is telling them to rejoice in the event or uh, that thing which is causing their pain. He's not. He's saying, listen, there's something greater here. Martha, Mary, your brother died, but there's something greater that's going to be done. I'm going to call him after being in the grave four days back to life. And he will eat with you again, and you will fellowship with him again. He will come back from the dead. And they, they couldn't imagine that. But that was the greater blessing God was going to give them. And they had that greater blessing for some time. If he did it in that incident, he's going to do it in our incidences. You've got to wait and see what God does through this situation in your life. But by reading a little further, we will see that this is not the cause. Number seven, our rejoicing is based on the promised outcome. The promised outcome. Knowing that the testing of your faith, it's testing your faith. Do, you've been taught all these things, but do you really know them? Do you really hold on to them? Or are they just something you can spout off that you know? The testing of your faith produces endurance. And it goes on and on and on to what it produces. Don't you know God is trying to make us mature? Of course he is. God wants to make you mature so he can use you better than you've ever been used. Use you in situations you wouldn't think you could ever be used in. Trials challenge our faith in God's wisdom, goodness, and power. But these verses, they reassure us that his purposes are good, and if we endure with trust and joy, we will lack nothing. In the end, we'll see it was good, and we'll praise him. Why not praise him by faith before you see it by sight? because you will see it by sight one day. When Paul told the Philippians to rejoice, 
he was declaring a deep conviction of his soul because he had repeatedly been tested in the tr crucible. He'd been whipped. He'd been scourged. He'd been left for dead. He'd been shipwrecked. I could go on and on and on. And when he said, I want you to rejoice in the Lord because God has a good reason for all of this, he knew that God was going to do something in the future. And look what God did. He used Paul to pen most of the New Testament. His words, his truth, and his reality. He wrote a letter while still in a Roman prison. Think about that. Roman prisons weren't fun places to be. You know, I, I look at the prisons today, and the prisoners complain about the prison, and uh, they have it so much better, so much better than those that were in the Roman prisons. Yes, it is difficult for them, and I don't say it isn't, but it's nothing like being put in a hole, not being fed properly, being in stocks many times, with God's God in you, misery, dampness, all of that. And he says, rejoice always in every situation. And he's in a Roman prison suffering under the law of that day of Rome. According to his circumstances, then, he had no reason, no reason to rejoice because of his relationship with Christ he could rejoice. He didn't say you rejoice and himself not rejoice. He actually took joy in tribulation. He took joy because he knew God was doing something. He was doing something that was going to redound to the glory of God. And it wasn't the only time the apostle himself experienced terrible situations. Paul and Silas were beaten, and they were thrown into an innermost part of the jail. And they had miserable situations, but they were singing songs in the night in praise to Jesus. What were they doing in this situation? They were focusing on Jesus. And Jesus came through for them. Jesus came through for them. He didn't come through before the misery was there, but he came through after the misery was experienced. God comes through when faith becomes a reality in my life. Number nine, number eight, excuse me. Paul and Silas didn't wait for conditions to improve before they sang. Rather, they demonstrated love and faith in the Lord by offering a sacrifice of praise to him right then and there as they were in this miserable situation. Can you do that? In the midst of your sorrow, in the midst of your terrible trial, in the midst of your sickness, in the midst of a pandemic, can you praise God from whom all blessings flow? Can we center on Jesus and think of how many blessings we have, not how many curses are in this world, for this world is full of curses. And if it's not this, it'll be something else. But if you focus on Jesus, the joy of the Lord is going to continue to be your strength. As a result, the other prisoners heard these two men praising God and evidently the jailer and his entire family received Christ as their Savior because Paul and Silas were praising God in a horrible situation. They centered their focus on Jesus. Can you imagine how many of those other prisoners might have received Christ? It's silent on that, but I can't imagine they'd stay right in the jail if Jesus wasn't working on them. Can you imagine how many people look at you every day and see, is your faith in Christ really sincere? Is it true? And you are actually proclaiming to others through your steadfast faith in Jesus Christ that they too 
can find that if they'll receive Christ as their Savior. You may never know it until you reach glory. But my friends, your life does affect other people's lives. And your faith affects other people's faith. And your prayers affect other people's prayers. Don't ever forget, you are God's witnesses. Number nine, Christians are told to rejoice not in the event, not in the problem that causes their suffering, but in the Lord. Keep that before you. Not in the problem. I hate the misery of the problem, but I want to focus my attention on Jesus in the midst of that. This is not a denial of our pain, but an opportunity to trust and praise God in that situation. Understanding first that we delight in our relationship with the Lord, that our sins are forgiven. I don't have to worry about that anymore. My sins were buried in the deepest sea of God's forgetfulness when I received him as my Savior, and they are no more. Even the future sins are no more. Now, that grace, that mercy, does not mean I can get away with sinning. If I sin on purpose, God will spank the devil out of me. And that's exactly what got into you, the devil. But you won't lack being this child. You won't lack having your sins totally buried and paid for in full. You have that as a bank account. You are forgiven. It is forgotten, and they're gone forever. But don't try to live in sin that grace may be abounding. Deal, because if you don't deal with sin in your life as a believer that's forgiven, God will use his spanking tool. And the worst he can do in your situation if you don't respond is scourge you by taking your life, getting you to heaven before you do any more foolishness. God loves you that much. God loves me that much. Number 10, second, we can exalt in the presence of the Holy Spirit within us. We can exalt in the presence of the Holy Spirit within us. The moment I ask Jesus to come into my life and save my soul, forgive my sins, he sent his Holy Spirit, the third person of the Trinity, God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit, he sent the Holy Spirit to live within me. You know, I have God's Spirit living within me as a believer in Jesus Christ. And so do you if you've received Christ. That's why you know when you've done wrong, the Spirit convicts you of your sin. When you're on, the Spirit makes you praise God because that's what the Spirit is leading you to do because you're living for Christ. My friends, I have the Holy Spirit within me. He empowers me to walk through any difficulty. I don't walk through that difficulty on my own. The Holy Spirit empowers me, gives me strength to walk through that difficulty or loss and produce his spiritual fruit in the lives of those who yield to his control. But the greatest focus of our rejoicing is in the Lord himself. The Lord himself. When we consider his unconditional love for us, when we consider his unfailing faithfulness to us and his compassionate understanding, how can we do anything else but praise him? Praise him. You're going to understand that a lot better than I am in heaven. And that's why we're praising him all the time. We're praising him in our attitude, our, our words. We're praising him. Of course we're serving him. We're doing what God has for us, which is too wonderful for words. But everything we do is a praise unto God. If our eyes are on the Lord, we will never lack reason to rejoice. 
very powerful statement. But if we lose sight of him and begin to focus on our feelings or circumstances, our spirits will plummet. They just will. You can't make it without a focus on Jesus. I've met Christians who have lost their joy. Number 11. But Christ wants us to have the fullness of joy. He doesn't want you to lose it. And that scripture commands us to rejoice. And that has led me to conclude that joyous believers, joyless believers, excuse me, have chosen a difficult lifestyle. If you don't choose to do it God's way, even as a believer, you can be miserable all the days of your Christian life on earth. Number 12, it is God's will that we delight in the Lord. We delight in the Lord. If each day has become a struggle and our circumstances are dragging us down, by faith claim the joy of the Lord. By faith claim the joy of the Lord, which is available to every Christian. Make a decision today, if the joy isn't there, to let God baptize you with his joy. Let's pray. Father, we thank you and we praise you that this is no time for dismal Christians, joyous Christians. This is a time when people have to see in the midst of a pandemic, in the midst of a, a political upheaval, in the midst of any problem they're going through physically or emotionally, this is a, a time to show that Jesus is our focus. That all these things are temporary, but Jesus, your eternal. Help us to focus on you as believers that we may have a joy unspeakable and full of glory. Now I'm speaking to those on the internet and on public access. Have you received Jesus Christ as your Savior? Do you know if you should die in the next five minutes that you would go to heaven? If you say, I hope so, you don't know so. I know I'm going to heaven if I should die within the next five minutes. I know it. What a, why do I say that? I say that because Jesus made a promise when I asked him to come in my life, forgive my sins, and save me. He said he will never cast me away. He has promised to save me for all eternity. I'm his child for all eternity. I can't lose what he gave me at the point of salvation. Have you received Christ as your Savior? And do you know this fact? That if you should die, you'd be with the Lord in heaven because of what Jesus did on that cross for you. If you've never received Christ, or if you have, but you, you just don't know you're going to heaven when you die, you're depending on going to church or being religious or not being a bad person. You don't want to depend on that. You're not going to get there that way. There's only one narrow way to know you're going to heaven when you die and that God is going to live within you while you're alive. And that's by receiving his son, Jesus Christ, into your life as your Lord and Savior. Lord means you do what he tells you to do in the Bible. Will you make that decision right now? If you will, say this prayer after me to God Almighty. Dear God, dear Heavenly Father, I ask you to forgive me all the wrong things I have done. I ask your son Jesus to come into my life and save my soul. I want to follow you the rest of my days. I want to live for you and have this joy that the pastor has been speaking of this morning. Forgive me for my sins. Come into my life and make me your child. 
I will read your word, the Bible. I will find a church that preaches your word. And I will live for you the rest of my days. And I pray this sincerely in Jesus' name.